So the game was different, right? The the, the rules was different. The ball oh, the was Euro, different. The, like, Euro, the Euro style is different in America. The Euro style was a lot different <laughs> than <in> America. <laughs> That's the Especially, first time y'all seen that Euro step too, huh? Absolutely. Hey, Coach, thanks for having me. My name is Joe Mantegna. I'm the head boys basketball coach at Blair Academy in northwestern New Jersey, which is about an hour outside of uh, New York City. Um, appreciate you having me here. This is my 22nd year at Blair. Um, before the last two decades at Blair, I was an NCAA coach in the States um, at two different Division I schools and two different Division II schools. So I believe this is year 30 at this crazy basketball Jeez. racket in the States. So I uh, appreciate you having me. Uh, great, great, great to have you on, Coach. Um, fantastic. Um, let's jump right into it. Um, why do you think the U.S. basketball system is preferred over, you know, European um, competition? Well, I, I don't think it's as preferred as it once was. I also think um, because of things like this, because of WhatsApp, because of YouTube, um, mm -hmm. the world has gotten much smaller. You're a lot, you're a lot younger than I am, but I remember being a uh, young assistant coach in the early '90s and, and getting tape from the Ukraine and having to take it to the communications lab at Boston University to get the tape, you know, turned over into what, what it would have been VHS, I guess, at that point. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, again, you're a lot younger than I am, but the world is so much smaller now. So to answer your question, I think we're all year by year more and more aware that there's really a ton of different paths to get yeah. to where kids want to go. And I think the arrogance of the U.S. coaches in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s is not there anymore. The world's smaller. We know how many great players and coaches there are all over the world. Um, and we're constantly learning from European coaches and African coaches and Asian coaches. And so I just think it's finding the right path to, to fit the right kid or the right mm -hmm. coach. I don't think that the U.S. path is the only path. Beautiful. And, and, and yeah, definitely, especially um, with some of the, the controversial issues with the NCAA in terms of paying or compensating their players and stuff. And you see um, players going overseas to play pro and then into the draft and stuff. So yeah, definitely a, a lot of different avenues and options. So yeah. And, um, and I honestly think that we'll be, I think there'll be academies in every you know, right now the prep schools like I work at are serving as faux academies, right? But mm -hmm. I think there'll be real basketball academies like IMG. I think those will exist in every state in the United States in the next 10 years. And so I think kids will be picking between real basketball academies. We already have them in soccer. Uh, mm -hmm. We have them in other sports. So I think there'll be real basketball academies like you have in Europe um, or prep schools. Um, or going over to overseas academies, whether it be Real Madrid or the, the academies yes. in the UK. So, you know, I, I think the options will be greater for kids uh, 10 years from now. Mm, it's going to be real interesting, i tell you that. Um, can you break down what type of players that you've sent to college in terms of were they all high level players or, you know, what, what range of players have you helped you know, send to college? Yeah, I mean, I, I, we've sent every level player. So we've sent probably 70 guys off to play in college, uh, five guys in the NBA, another, oh, I don't know, eight or nine guys who've played all over Europe and Asia and Africa. So, you know, we've had a lot of pros and, and we've had a lot of, of high level scholarship guys, but we've also had division three guys, which is non-scholarship in the United States. Um, we've had division two guys. We've had academic guys at the Ivy League schools and whatnot. You know, we've had guys play at Duke and Stanford and Texas and Virginia and, and all the places you would see on TV. So um, there is no one kind of guy we've helped place. We've placed guys at every level, uh, every size, every skill set. Um, and so it's it's been rewarding that way. I, I don't think there's a cookie cutter kid that we've helped at Blair, you know, get to college. Perfect. Um, and that's kind of interesting. I know, you know, there's going to be kids watching this and um, wanting to know, you know, whether they're undersized or, you know, they're, they're really tall or whatever. Um, and just trying to gauge, I guess, um, or figure out what their chances are. Um, and I know you said you've, you've sent to every level and all types of kids, but is there a, a specific uh, position that gets recruited more than the other? Overseas. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Overseas kids. Is there is there a, a, 
like a specific position that gets recruited heavier than other positions? Well, look, let's be honest, right? There's a there's always a shortage of size. Um, and, and so, you know, I think people will take chances on size. People will go outside of their normal recruiting realms to get size, whether that's me bringing in high school kids or whether that's universities. Um, so those kids have a natural advantage. Um, and, and then the second piece to that puzzle is skill. And I think that's for especially the European kids um, and not as much in the UK, right? I mean, the skill level in the UK is not as high as it might be in Spain and Italy and, and some other countries. And I'm generalizing, of course. I mean, there's, yeah, there's yeah, a yeah. number of really skilled guys in the UK, but the depth of skill um, is not there. I think it will be in this next generation with all these good coaches at these academies in the UK. But I think, you know, when people go outside of their normal recruiting to get kids, it would be for size and, and skill. Um, and, and those are certainly the two things. I think the skill level is getting better in the States. Um, but, you know, there's always going to be a shortage of size. I, I will tell you what they won't do. Um, if colleges can get an American kid who's like a British kid or like, a you know, another European kid, yeah. they're going to take the American kid because it's less work. Hands right. They, they Hands down, less work. Um, they don't have to worry about them getting back and forth from home. There's homesickness issues they don't have to deal with, et cetera. Now, if they can't get a kid, kid from the, the UK or, or Italy or Spain is better, then they're of course, because they're all getting paid to win games and it's a business at the university level. So, yeah. you know, if they find a guy anywhere who can help them win games, they'll figure it out. But I don't think the European guys will win many ties. Okay, okay, I, yeah, and, and that's pretty, you know, keeping it blunt and honest, yeah, that's pretty much. Um, what are the processes involved in getting a player to the States? Well, again, you know, at our level, there's there's I-20 visas that you and I were talking about offline. I mean, yeah. you know, they're gonna need to have, you're gonna need to go to a, a high school that allows for the I-20 travel visas so that so a kid can come legally from an immigration standpoint. Hopefully it'll lighten up a little bit now that Trump is on his way out of here, but um, you know, it, it's been tough. Um, and, then, and then secondly, <clears throat> you know, from a university and from a prep school standpoint, the academics are gonna need to be in place. So whatever the academic demands are of that particular school, you're gonna have to reach it. And the NCA has not been very kind to British kids no. because of their lack of understanding of the GCSEs and the A-levels. And, and so we've had to help a lot of British kids navigate. Uh, frankly, the NCA's ill-conceived understanding of the British schooling system. It's it's. I've had shouting matches with NCA people on the phone really? um, about this over the last 10 years because they think that the GCSEs are graduating from high school high school in the states yeah, yeah, yeah. and in fact those kids are often as you know 16 years old and that's yeah. not when kids in the states graduate from high school so then that gets into the whole a levels and o levels and, and things that you probably know better than i do but uh i've been down this road too many times so so, many so times. for the british school system kids it's a little complicated and you better have somebody um, that can advocate for you and explain to you how the system works because what you don't want to do is come to the states and then Put your eligibility for staying at a university in jeopardy if in fact that's your goal yes yes definitely um and you know as you said offline we spoke about a young man that i had who got penalized um in this last this last you know covid session so um yeah it's it's, it's a ton of reading and it's a ton of you know trying to figure out and talking to people but yeah you have to do your research um in order to 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 make sure that your eligibility is preserved. And, um, and I'll tell you, there's a lot of people that, and I didn't mean to cut you off coach, there's a lot of people that um, that we've run into trying to help kids in the UK that say they know um, <laughs> and, and they have no idea. And, they're, and they're, they're telling kids to basically make decisions that are gonna cost them years of eligibility if they wanna stay. Again, there's a lot of different ways as we spoke about the beginning. You can go back and do university in the UK. Um, you can turn pro, so there's there's other ways to go. But if the goal is to go to the university in the states, you better darn well have somebody that can explain how the NCA looks at the UK schooling system. And coach, this is the, you know this is the reason why I put the platform together, just so that they you know kids can start looking at these things, start understanding. It's not just hey, my coach has said 
go and play for the school and the coach, you know, uh, like myself, I've never played collegiate sports. I've sent a bunch of kids to, you know, help kids to programs, but I've never played. So I don't really know. I've never gone through the clearinghouse myself. So I can't, you know, I can't tell uh, players categorically what it is, but, you know, having guys like yourself on and having the guys who've graduated and gone through the process and, and, and college coaches that have recruited those guys, they have more of an understanding. Um, and there's always loopholes and, you know, fine lines and small print kind of thing, which, you know, you need to understand unless you, you know, you don't want to go over to you know, come over to the States and just be in trouble. So, yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, yeah, no doubt. I give you the two line version. One is if you if you take your GCSEs and complete your GCSEs, then you only have one year to play in high school in the States. Mm-hmm. Now, if you take your A-levels and complete those, then you only have one year to play in your states before your clock starts, which means you're, you're five years to play four in the university. Um, so the best time to come over is either before you complete your GCSEs and come over for three years, four years of high school. A lot of kids don't want to do that, of course, it's a long way from home. Or do a postgraduate year after you complete usually A-levels, you know, and, and so those are the two options that we see at Blair a lot. Um, what you don't want to do is come over as a 15, 16 year old completing GCSEs and do two or three more years of high school in the States. If you do that, then you run the risk of having eligibility taken away at the collegiate level in the States. So that's the mistake that we've seen kids make over and over. And frankly, a lot of unsavvy people in Great Britain telling kids to do that. And, and you know, I don't think that's what kids should be doing. Mm, yeah, it's tough. Um, as a coach, what qualities should a player have in order to be recruited? Well, look, it's business when you get to the college level in the States, especially at the scholarship level. It's just business and, and, and you're sort of owned, you're on a scholarship and, and I, I don't mean to put it in those terms, especially- I love hearing you say it like you that. You know, I mean, we're in a time of a racial reckoning here and, and but but it is, it's, you know, it's hours and hours a day, it's weights, it's study hall, it's classes, it's meeting with academic advisors, it's, it's conditioning, it's practice, it's extra shots that you're expected to take in the facility. So, you know, if you don't love the process of improving then probably NCAA scholarship basketball is not for you. If you're a guy back home in the UK that works out twice a week and kind of hangs out and is talented and plays, um, it's going to be a huge adjustment to the work rate that, that is expected. And then obviously culturally, it's going to be different. You know, I mean, we all speak the same language, but I've spent a lot of time in the UK now through my work with the Luol Dang Foundation. and have a lot of great friends in the basketball world in the UK, but the basketball culture, um, the rules, the coaching, the FIBA versus US, I mean, everything is different. There's going to be, there's going to be a transition period for every kid that goes to college. And there's going to be a bigger transition period for, for a kid that comes from outside the country usually. So what I always tell kids, is if you don't, if you're not in love with the process of getting better, then probably NCAA basketball is not where you want to be because it's hours and hours a day. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it's a lot. It's a lot of um, heartache. You know, the cliche blood, sweat, and tears. But it's a lot of you know shortcomings and you know getting things wrong. Uh, the first series, the, the the question that I often ask. Um, and I like like hearing the, the the answer is amazing. Is you know when you come from these programs, when you get recruited, you get recruited as the man or you know the girl, kind of like the high up the totem pole. And then when you go to these programs, you go from here it's straight back down. And it's like if you can't mentally get over that hurdle of you know trying to work your way back up or whatever, it is tough. Yeah, yeah. and that's what I mean. You know, like having the grit and the resilience to battle because I did it. I was a college coach. You recruit a kid and then as soon as they get there, you start to de-recruit them. Well, actually you weren't quite as good as I told you you were when we recruited you here. (laughs) Well, actually you might not be starting. Well, actually you might not be in the rotation. Well, actually, you know, we're not going to let you shoot 12 (laughs) times a game. So, um, you know, kids get really shocked by being de-recruited. It's shocking to kids. And especially if they come from a program where they've been the man, 
it's really hard for people to deal with not being the man or the woman like you said after they have been and so you know now when i even when i look to bring kids to blair i really try to measure their resilience and grit because oftentimes that's the separator for somebody who's going to be successful and in, in, in a lot of areas of life right not just college yeah. basketball yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but grit and resilience is such an incredibly um valuable soft skill for all of us coach this is i mean this is gold i mean the fact that you just said about the deep that is gold because yeah i love it um is there a, uh from the range of players that you've helped um play college basketball is there a common skill set well i i think if a if a skill set is loving basketball which i've already mentioned i think okay. that's an under under thought about skill if i okay. went back and was a college coach again now that i've been a head high school coach for 22 years you know try to figure out who loves it which i've mentioned already yeah, 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 the yeah. second thing um, to me, one of the separators of my guys who are really good in college and my guys that are, you know, okay or whatever is, is IQ. Um, and, and frankly, this is what's really getting better in the UK. I mean, I'm looking at some of these kids that are coming out of these academies that are really well coached in the UK by some friends of mine who've become friends of mine now that run some of the best academies in the UK. And, you know, the IQ is improving. Um, the kids that are coming out of the, the, the British kids are, are much better coached when they're young. They've gotten more game reps. They've gotten more gym time now if they're at these academies. And um, so I think the other big separator, because, you, you know, you're not going to be out, able to out athleticize and play harder than every single guy you run into. At some point, you're going to have to have a deep understanding of the game. Well, take in the scanner report and remember that you got to send number 12 left and you got to send number you know nine right and we're going to play drop coverage when five man ball screens and we're going to play you know ice coverage when the four man ball and to be able to do all that you know, pretty high understanding of the game um so so love for the game is one and iq uh, and they often go hand in hand frankly it is two and um you know those are huge. Uh, perfect. Um, what's the first step in getting a player recruited? I think you have to have, you know, film. And I, and I don't mean to be elementary here, but I, I don't know exactly what my audience is of player back home, you know, back in your home. But, um, you know, you have to have film that you can send to people. No, nobody's going to recruit you on word. They might film based on word of mouth, but be really interested in recruiting you you're going to need film that that shows both live game action if you want to throw in some skill develop stuff i to you know i'm not giving a scholarship to until i've seen them play in a live scenario against you know at least decent competition which which you know certainly now exists in the uk in a way that it didn't consistently exist for kids 15 or 20 years ago um now when you say in live action, and this is my gripe, so I tell a lot of my players, in all the years I've been coaching, I've never seen a bad highlight tape. So I've never seen a highlight tape where a kid's missed a shot or they've gotten blown by on defense or whatever. Right. So is a highlight tape more important than sending a live game? Or would you say it's about equal or, I mean, how do you, you know, what-, what So, so if I'm a college coach, wet my appetite with the highlight tape, right? I don't have time. If I don't know this random kid from Manchester, England, I don't have time to sit down and watch an entire Manchester Magic game. So send me a highlight tape that's two or three minutes first to wet my appetite. But yes, for sure, for sure, for sure, I'm gonna need full game, you know, footage where I can see the good, the bad, the ugly, the flow, the understanding. Um, the body language, the whole thing. Nice. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to want to see all of that in a live game. But you can get my interest with a two or three minute highlight tape on YouTube. And that, so, so if I have a transcript um, and if I have a highlight tape, then that's the jumping off point. Okay. Right. And, and then, and then we get into, of course, I'm not doing anything without seeing live game action as well. But uh, you can get my interest as a college coach with a highlight tape and uh, and a and a, and a tra academic transcript. Okay. Um, knowing what it takes to be a, a a college recruit, can you break down how much work um, 
goes into a player being recruited. So like how many hours, would you say 10,000 hours or, you know, how much work has got to go into it? I know you said loving the game and all the rest of it, but what does it consist of? So do you mean the actual process of recruiting or what I need to do with my game to get good enough to be recruited? Which which side of that are we talking about? What, what you have to do um, on the court, what, what of your game needs to be done to be recruited? Yeah, I mean, listen, we all know the amount of hours it takes to be highly, highly skilled, right? To be able to shoot, to be able to dribble, to be able to pass, to be able to finish with both hands. Um, and then there's going to be work on athleticism and strength, and that's separate work, speed work, strength work, athleticism work, um, skill work. And then there's going to be the hours and hours of live play that you're going to need just to develop feel and IQ. And so with all that rolled together, yes, you're in the 10,000 hour rule and, and know that there's a lot of people out there working <laughs> and every day you don't work, somebody else is working. And, and for the U.S. kids, I tell them all the time, you know, I'm getting videos now of kids playing outdoors in Mali and, you know, Lagos, Nigeria and South Sudan, you know, Luol Deng just built a court in Juba, South Sudan. So, um, you know, there's always somebody out there working. There's always somebody out there getting a hundred more shots than you are. And I know if you're not in an academy in the UK for for young kids, the, the real issue is gym time in the UK, unless you're at an academy. And so, you know, I think you really need to figure out how you can access the gym. I mean, one of the reasons that a lot of uh, the kids from the UK come to prep school or go to academies in the UK is that they want to be able to access the gym and get those thousand shots a week up and have the weight training facilities and not have to, you know, be on the train or long drives with their parents to get to, to work out that it's right there where they are. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if you don't have access to facilities, it's hard to get the hours to be a viable person to be recruited unless, you know, you're seven feet and you run a, you know, and you have a 30 inch vertical jump and, and <laughs> the world finds those people. <laughs> it kind of just naturally happens, huh? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> um, how, how important is education to this whole process? Well, I think it's really important and I'm biased because I'm at a, I'm at a high academic school, but, um, you know, John Thompson, the great, the late, great John Thompson used to say, don't, don't you, don't, uh, let, don't use, use the game. Don't let the game use you, you know? And, and so I think if, if you're going to sacrifice going away from home and, and leaving London or Manchester or, you know, anywhere in the UK or Ireland, you know, and to come to the States, whether for prep school or for, um, or for college, like you should want to come and get everything you can get from it, you know, make make relationships with people that are different from you and come from different places, get the best education you can get, and then also develop yourself as a basketball player. If you don't take advantage of all three of those things, why make the sacrifice to leave home? You know, because it's a huge sacrifice, obviously, to come to a distant land and do something totally outside the box. So I think it's huge. And, and, and secondly, Again, when you're talking about breaking ties, right? I already said, like, I'm not going to take some kid as a college coach from London if I get that same kid from Philadelphia, right? Mm -hmm. But now if the kid from London's an A student and the kid from Philadelphia is a C student, then now that might break the tie in favor of one of the guys that are watching this YouTube video. Um, you know, so I, I think the more things you can bring to the table to make someone want to recruit you, the better. And academics is certainly a big piece to that. Yeah. And if you go to a place that doesn't care about academics and there are places out there like that, just know what you're getting. You know, you're getting a place that is not going to set you up for later life. And that and that's OK for some kids who aren't yeah. as academic. Um, but, you know, if, if you have access to academics at a high level, you should take. Them. Now, just on that, because I've got, you know, here at high school as well, I'm having issues with one of my guys and I keep telling him, hey, you can't go any further or you know your your path is really limited if you don't get your grades or you don't pass your classes now can you you know what's your views on that you know are there possibilities for guys to move on without having grades well there's places called junior colleges and i know there's a, a lot of the kids that we work with at dan camp um, end up at junior colleges because a lot of them are from sort of urban schools in the uk that that don't do as good a job with with preparing them just like the many of the schools 
in poor areas of, of the states, you know, so n no different. Um, so there is a route called junior colleges where you can go for two years. And then from there, if you get a degree from a junior college, it's almost like an academic restart. Then you can go on to a major college and a four year college and get a degree from that. But again, with no academics, you are lowering your options and, and they're more apt to take a non-academic hit down the road from their junior college from, you know, uh, Kansas City than they are from London uh, or whatnot. So you're just limiting options with, with academics. But I will tell you, Coach, as someone who's done this a long time, and I've had a few kids that didn't want to take care of their academic piece, they'll call you in 10 years. And they'll say, I should have listened to you back when I was at your school in New Mexico. And uh, you'll hear from him because I hear from him now. One of one of my former guys is a coach now and he hit me up. He was like, man, I don't know how you coached me when I was 15. Like these guys are knuckleheads. I said, yeah, no kidding. So, uh, you know, most of them get the message. But every once in a while, you don't get through to them until they're 25 years old. Too late, too late for their basketball, but some, they figure mad. it out. <laughs> um okay cool so last one in this section um so would you advise a player to go to a better basketball school or would you t advise them to go to a, a better academic school well they have to know and not all kids know this but they have to be honest about what they want their end game to be so if they're trying to play you know, in Europe professionally for 12 years afterwards, and they're trying to use this as a launching pad to play, then they should probably go to the best basketball scenario where also they can play and put up numbers and, and be a part of the, in time, be a part of the playing group. So they have statistics to go play professionally in Europe. Um, if they're maybe thinking about being a doctor or a lawyer, and they're just using the game to get a free education and to jumpstart their professional career, then probably they should be making decisions based more on academics. And I know every 18, 19 year old kid thinks they're going to play in the NBA or the BBL or, you know, or what, what not the Spanish professional league. But, you know, I think that's where you as a mentor and a coach, you can have really honest conversations with them and their parents about what they want their end game to be. Mm, very true. Very true. Um, and it's not, one shoe fits all so no it's yeah, not you, said, it's, it's, you kind of kind of got to think ahead and hopefully there's somebody to kind of temper your expectations or you know a realistic goals of where you're going to end up so yeah definitely and um, i'll tell you I, i've been thinking a lot about a lot of things as i've been stuck in quarantine here for the better part of the last nine months and i don't mean to go off topic geez. but when i was younger I always tried to have hard and fast rules for everything, whether it was how to parent my kids or how to be a better husband or how to coach my team or only this defense works or only this ball screen coverage works or this is the way we're going to play. And it was more black and white when I was younger. And, and the older I get, like, I feel like every time someone has me on a podcast or, you know, we talk about coaching or I do a Zoom call, like, it depends. Like so much of the answers are, it depends whether we're talking about kids getting recruited or what ball screen coverage to play, or do you want to play fast or slow? And, you know, it just depends. And, and, and so I think as you get older and gain a little more wisdom, you become more okay with just saying it depends. And I'm going to take every situation individually and try to work through it that way and not have some sort of hard and fast rules. The question that you asked is a really good question, but the answer is it depends. And, you know, I'm happy to go into whatever detail you want, but it always depends. Mm, mm, definitely um and it, you know i think the biggest thing is the individual you know that's the the biggest you know yes you might you know uh, i was talking to um len bush who's, who's coaching the, the gb20s and um his daughter went to penn state and i said to him hey why didn't she go to a different school because she's you know good enough and he was like well she wanted to go to an ivy league school so you pen you pen you're saying yeah you sorry, yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, UPenn, yeah yep yep UPenn, yep yeah. um so yeah it, it was a it was the big difference of the academics versus going somewhere where it's a better basketball program so right. yeah as you said it depends on 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 the player and their ambitions and what they want to achieve with their life so um right so looking at coaches now um coaches that are you know helping kids um how can coaches aid development of players that want to play in the states if you're you know if you're talking to any of these european coaches and you say hey 
this is what you should be able to do or this is what you need to do to help your players go and play college basketball well how about start with this be honest with them you know Ooh, don't be okay. the, don't be their friend be honest this with them give them your truth every day and if if you develop a rapport with your players and you know and they know that you love them and care about them then you can be brutally honest with them on a daily basis and tell them your truth and so i think a lot of people miss out from a coaching standpoint because they're trying to be friends with their players or they're trying to make their players like them or whatnot but my thing is you know care, players care and steve clifford who's my mentor who's the head coach of the orlando magic now he always used to say this like players only care about two things they care about can this guy help me get better and and does this guy care about me and and, and really so as a young coach like that should be your jumping off point. Like, do I care about these kids and do I have the skill to help them get better? And, and that, that can come in a lot of forms. Like that can be individual workouts, that can be motivating kids, that can be tactical stuff, helping them with tactics. Hopefully as we all become better and better coaches, it's all of those things. It could be psychology, um, it could be athletic training and strength and conditioning, SNC as you guys like to call it. Um, but you know, so, so all those things you can help someone get better but but if the kid knows that you care about them and and the kid knows that there's something you can do to help them then it's pretty easy and then you can tell them the truth because they we all need people in our lives that are going to tell us the truth about where we are and, and so many kids get lied to you know people don't want them to leave their academy or they don't want them to leave their team or they don't want them to go to prep school in the states they want to keep them in london or you know whatever it is they don't want them to transfer universities and so they lie to these kids and these kids heads are filled with and then there's a reckoning you know at some time they get to a point where there's a reckoning man like these people have been lying to me i'm not as good as i thought he wa i was oh, i'm man. not as tough as i thought i was um i'm not as academic as i thought i was and and you know, I, I was on a I was on a Zoom call with USA Basketball the other night. We had Dame Lillard on, and uh, and and Dame and it was the best hundred basketball players in the U.S. And, and it was a few of us coaches. And Dame looked into the screen at the end. He said, "You know what, fellas? I don't care how many followers you have. I don't care how many likes you got on Twitter. I don't care if you make McDonald's All American." at some point you're going to run into an mf -er like me and he didn't say mf -er. <laughs> he, he looked dead into the screen and he goes what are you going to do then and, and so my Ooh. thing is you know like you got to tell these kids the truth so when that day of reckoning comes whether it's dame or whether it's justin you got to guard justin robinson in the bbl mm -hmm. or or you know you got to get on the court at the division two college you're at in the states like there's going to be a day of reckoning where you're you're going to be glad somebody told you the truth the, hey, that's awesome, coach. Um, I, that's such a big point of coaches not telling telling it how it is, um, and it, it, yeah, it causes a lot more damage. Um, there's no point trying to be friends. Do you know what I mean? And, and I think a lot of kids can get butt hurt nowadays. I, I get called a hater constantly um, over the last couple of years that, that you know, that vernacular has become more and more pop. Oh, you're a hater, you're a hater. Cause you, hey, you can't shoot. Yeah, but I can, I, I can hit a three and it's one three out of, you know, 12. And it's like, oh yeah, I'm a, and you're like, no. So yeah, just be honest, man. Definitely just be honest. Um, do you need to predominantly focus on your, you know, if you've got a team and you're only focusing on the guy that's going to college, um, is it more game-based? Is it more training-based? Like, where should you do most of your um, your focus, should I say, if I'm putting it as right? As a coach, as a coach, yeah, you're talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's both, right? Like, I, I think you need to pour hours into kids' games you know, just the individual games. So whether it be ball handling with both hands, whether it be dribble moves off the move, whether it be finishing, shooting, catch and shooting, shooting off the move, right? Playing fast, ball screen stuff. Um, you gotta pour yourself into those kids so they're prepared for all that. And they need reps and reps and reps and reps. And we do a lot of that in the fall and the spring. When we're in the dead of our season, then more of our skill development will be around the actual actions that we're running in games, getting guys shots from where they're likely to get shots during the way we play. Um, and, and, and more of it is, is in flow 
but uh, I think you need to do both, you know, like I think if you're only developing kids to play well in your system, then mm -hmm. that's selfish as a coach and it's yeah. not what's best for the kid long term. Um, but I also don't believe in only pouring into a kid, you know, generalities and training because you want them to have that game tape where they play really good in a five on five scenario. And if they, you know, they're going to get five catch and shoots off of pin downs and the way you play, then they better be getting a lot of reps shooting off a of pin down to get their inside foot turned in. So again, my answer is it's both. It depends, but I, you know, the way we, we break it up is sort of in season and off season. And I'll tell you this too, like from a training standpoint, we want kids to understand their role within our team. Like, you know, maybe you're that 6'11 raw kid and we don't really want you shooting threes in games yet, but we're still going to work on shooting threes for those kids. We still do guard training. I have a 6'11, you know, African kid that does guard training every day. Mm -hmm. um, and so what Brad Stevens of the Celtics calls it is dream sequences. So we like to end a lot of our training sessions with dream sequences, whether that's, you know, our guards shooting NBA threes, even though our three point line is four feet in or whether that's our bigs, you know, working on transition pull ups, you know, which we would never let them shoot. But, you know, we want to make sure that we see that there's going to be room for growth for you. And, and so that's also part of in season and out of season, out of season. We're okay with our guys working on more things that they maybe aren't yet, yet, big word, big growth mindset word, right? Then they're not yet ready to do in games. Um, but yet in season, we don't want, you know, because time is limited. We don't want to spend as much time on our dream sequences in season because that's not when they're going to grow their games. you got to grow your game in the summer, the spring, the fall. And then in the winter, that's when you got to play within the confines of a system. Beautiful. I absolutely, yeah. Um, sounds spot on to me. Um, hey, coach, loving it by the way. Loving, loving uh, the responses. Uh, now, it's a good, this is a little bit different for you. Um, so, yeah, you're going to have to try and put yourself in an a, a international coach's spot. But what's the best way to contact college coaches to let them know about your player? Yeah, I. I I think it's to, to go on the website and figure out who the assistant coach in charge of recruiting is. And, and there's usually someone listed as a recruiting coordinator, or if not, you take one of the top two assistants and reach out to them. And if you don't hear anything from them and it's a bigger school and they have a director of basketball operations or an intern or a graduate manager at the higher levels where they have five, six assistant coaches, then reach out to one of the lowest level assistants because they always want to be able to run into the head coach's office and say, hey, have you seen this kid from, from the UK? So I would start with, you know, who it appears would be the recruiting assistant, which would be one of the top guys. And then if you don't hear from them, go to, you know, one of the bottom rung guys and see if you can develop a rapport there. You know, I think emails work fine. Um, I think those are a good starting point. I wouldn't necessarily reach out to the head coach directly because they're busy doing other things and they're just going to farm that email out to the assistant coach anyway. So I would usually go through the assistants. I mean, I have relationships now with head coaches that haven't yeah. done this, but, but if I were just cold calling a university, that's what I would do. Okay. I mean, yeah, you, you've been around for a while and you produce some amazing talent. So, so you're, you're saying I'm old, huh? <laughs> I'm saying you're well seasoned. <laughs> Experienced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, I know what that means. I know what that means. <laughs> uh, uh, what's the worst thing a coach can do for a player that wants to play um, college ball? I guess it kind of goes back to the you know the, the first thing is like be honest so i guess lying to him is probably one of the worst things but is there anything else yeah i mean i think if you you you're you mean to the when i when when i as the coach in the uk speak to someone in the states or what i'm saying to the players what you're what you're saying or doing uh for the player so you know what's the worst thing i can you know me not recording games or me not teaching my big man to handle or me, you know, uh, suppressing my guards game. What's the worst thing I can do uh, for my player as a coach who wants to go? Yeah, to I, I think, listen, I, I mean, I think if we're not developing skill 
every month and trying to add tools to the kids toolbox, regardless of how that affects our team, then we're doing kids a disservice. I think if we allow kids to not be fit and play games when they're not in shape, so they won't make shots in big times, we're doing a kid a disservice. If we allow kids not to compete hard and not play hard and not be competitive and not call them on that, we're doing kids a disservice. If we don't understand it is a positionless game now and that guards need to be able to post, look at Villanova, um, look at look at all kinds of guys in the NBA, Chris Paul posts all the time, backs guys down. If we don't, as you said, understand that, you know, there might be the next Giannis out there rolling around who's seven feet tall and is going to be able to rip and go from the perimeter and shoot threes and lead the break. Um, you know, we need to grow with the game. And frankly, I think in Europe, um, you know, I think we're catching up now, but I think you guys have done a better job of that. I mean, again, when I got started in the 80s and the 90s, you know, there was no such thing as a stretch five. And we thought those Lithuanian stretch fives were soft and, you know, and now we're all playing that way. You know, I play five out here now and I play my two six eleven guys behind the three point line. So, um, you know, I think we as coaches need to be open to the changing game and, and we as coaches need to, and I know your question is about players, you know, hold guys accountable, push them, be honest with them, add to their skill, make them be competitors um, because ultimately, you know, there aren't still that many kids coming from the UK to play college basketball. You're going to have to be pretty special. Uh, and if we don't push guys to be special, how are they ever going to be special? Because it's human nature. I talk to my guys all the time about human nature. Like it's, it's not, if we're doing pretty well in our little academy in the UK, like it, most of us aren't wired to reach down for more. We're not Kobe Bryant. We're not Luol Deng. You know, Luol Deng, he dominated every practice we had for four years at Blair Academy. And even though he was the best guy, he just wanted to step on everybody's throat every day. But most of us aren't wired that way. And we need to be pushed by somebody else to be that way. And um, so, you know, I think that's what our job as coaches is to do. Sorry, I hope that answer wasn't too long. Uh, no, 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 it's, it's perfect. Um, definitely. Uh, last question for the coaches is, um, would you say that you are a good coach only if you can get players to the States. Is your worth as a coach judged upon getting kids to um, college programs? No, I don't think so at all. Um, I don't even think US colleges are the right place for every kid. I, in fact, I don't think they're the right place for most kids. Um, I think the only thing we should be measured on as coaches, whether it's academy coaches in the UK or whether it's someone like me is, are we getting kids incrementally better? Are we providing an atmosphere where kids can get incrementally better? Um, you know, and then, and then are they growing as human beings, as young men or women under our auspices? I mean, that's what we have to do daily. Are you getting be a, be a better man? And are you a better player incrementally every day you're under me? That's it. If that leads to a kid going to the States or going to Real Madrid or, or whatever it is, great. If it just leads to, hey, I've gotten a lot better and I know when I'm an accountant, I know how to grind now and I know about incremental progress and I know about growth mindset, um, then that's great too, you know? Um, and I would say to guys who are taking jobs in the UK, like they better darn well be understanding of what the club or the academy expects of them, <laughs> you know, like, um, cause I would go at it differently if I was just getting ready, kids ready to go to the States. Like if that was my sole job, then I would have, I would approach my job differently. Um, because the style of basketball is different. The physicality is different. The rules are different. The shot clock's different. The ball screen stuff is different. And so, you know, you, you might have to almost, really study the American college style and get kids more ready for that. Um, if, if in fact that was your only job. Okay. Yeah. I hear you. Um, a couple of, a few more, uh, views on college ball. So what's your views on the different levels of basketball is Ju Juco bad is, um, is a player a failure if they don't go to division one. No, I, I think you have to go where you're going to have a great experience. 
I think you have to go where you're going to improve. Um, there's a lot of kids that have gone through JUCO basketball and had really successful both JUCO and then on to Division One and Division Two careers. I don't think that's bad. Um, NAIA is a great place for kids that don't have very strong academics to go. Um, I wouldn't go to an NAIA school if I was a really strong student, and that's a generalization, but those are really good places for kids to go if they're not as strong academically. Um, and, and honestly, like if you're not at Duke or Kansas or UCLA or Kentucky, there's not a huge difference from playing in a low or mid-major division one and playing at a top division two like you're not going to win the national championship anyway you're probably not going to play in the final four so then you need to go to a place where you you know the community feels right the coach feels right you can get on the court um, and free college is free college you know like and at the end of the day when they tip that ball whether you're playing at florida tech or whether you're playing at, you know, Bradley, where I know both places where some of our Dan Camp kids have gone. I mean, it's it's ball, man. And 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 so, you know, that's the way I would look at it. It should not be Division One or bust. Perfect. I know there's a lot of kids that feel that way. You know, when you, some of the times you get these situations for these kids and, you know, you're like, oh, I've got this program in D2 that's interested. I've got this um you know low level d1 and they're like no i want to everyone wants to play for duke louisville gonzaga you know what i mean everyone wants to get that limelight and you're like hey sometimes it's just not for you there's no point um but yeah that's as where a, it's good to have someone that can help you navigate that because kids can't have and the kids in the u.s that i work with can't navigate it either you know <laughs> so, um, those are conversations i know you have with your guys in new mexico i have them here at blair and, and i know there's academy coaches having them um in the uk so we're all we're all having those conversations trying to trying to give them that that i think it was it was it the blue pill in the matrix is that the real one <laughs> yeah trying, trying to force feed them um uh does extremely talented players have to go to, I guess we've really spoke about this, um, so it doesn't have to be long, but does an extremely talented player, so let's say like Luau when he was younger, you know, does he have to, did he have to go to Duke to be successful? Do you think if you, you think if he went to ACB and Real Madrid, do you think he would have been just as successful? Yeah, no question. I mean, look at Luka Doncic now and, um, and, and also like the NBA guys now, they're, they're, they have an understanding of how high the level is in the different European leagues and, and look at Giannis. I mean, the NCA is not the only path. Um, and, and if you do go the NCA path, you know, the reason we sent Lou to Duke uh, was because he, we knew he always wanted to do, I know you're not asking about Lou, but I'm just using this as an example. We knew he always wanted to do work for Africa and South Sudan beyond basketball. And we thought the highest level of sort of, um, the highest level platform that could be provided was like Duke or Kentucky or whatnot. And, and, and when you're trying to raise money for nonprofits later to have Duke alums behind you and whatnot, that kind of money. So, you know, even that decision of Duke that I made with he and his family, you know, wasn't totally a basketball decision. You know what I mean? It was using the Duke platform. So, uh, but no, there's a million ways to get to the promised land now, much more so than when I started at this. And, and I'm really, you know, I obviously talk to a lot of NBA scouts and assistant GMs and stuff. And, and you know, those guys are very savvy about the, the, the different levels in the European leagues. And, and they really understand the academy systems and, and way more than they did 15 or 20 years ago. Sorry, that wasn't a short answer, but that, no, no, that's no, it's fine. That's why, like, yeah, um, I'm just very cautious of your time. Uh, last two questions, though. Um, can you give me negatives of playing college ball? I know we talk about, you know, the good and they can go other levels, but you know, let's say um, you had a young man or a, or a young young lady that wanted to know like the pros and cons. What would you say the the negatives are? playing college basketball yeah i mean listen the, the negatives are you have to do a lot of schoolwork so for some people that's a negative that's just that much more time that you're not in the gym um and that you're not moving on to be a professional 
obviously a huge negative. I mean, at least now they have food stipends where they make three, four, five thousand dollars, but a huge, you know, I just had a young man from my team at Blair not come back for his senior year in COVID and he went to the NBL in, in Australia and, you know, he's making a hundred grand. And so obviously another thing of college is, you know, you're, you're not getting paid. Um, and some of these guys that are really elite when they're 16, 17 years old can get paid. Um, and some people may need that money for their families. Um, and the third thing is they, as I said earlier, they own you. They're taking hours and hours of your time. Your, your day is not your own. Um, there's a lot of pulls at your time and, and you're, you're very systematic at most of these places. You know, the, the, the skill development they're doing is for their system. Yes. Um, the, the growth they're doing is for the system. You're talking about college coaches that are making two, $3 million a year. Like ultimately, I don't care how much they care about a kid, they're trying to keep their jobs. And so while I know pro coaches are too, at least you're getting paid yeah. while they're trying to keep their jobs. So I think college is not the route for every kid. And I, you would have never caught me saying that 10 years ago, but I, I'm, I really believe that now. I think there's a lot of different routes. Perfect. I, yeah, um, that that whole paying thing is um, definitely crazy, and, and understanding, just getting these young people to understand that, yes, coaches recruit you and all the rest of it, but at the end of the day, these coaches have a job. They have mortgage payments. They have families. They have, hey, they yeah, they're trying to win games and keep their position. So yeah. Um, last question, coach. Um, what advice would you give to someone who is 14 to 18 or 14 to 17 who dreams to play basketball in the States? What's your overall takeaway, um, you know, for, the, for, for those that want to know? Well, the clock is ticking. I mean, I have a death clock on my computer that I look at every day that is set to 75 years and I watch it tick. I watch every second tick right on my right on my desktop every day. When I open it up, my death clock is ticking. Every That's day. a bit gruesome, Coach. <laughs> yeah, I, some some of the guys on my team think it's kind of gross, but um, I, I look at it as a very positive thing. Like motivate me to use my days, right? And so what I tell kids all the time is, you know, the clock is ticking. The window of time you have to do whatever you're going to do with a sport is ticking. Um, my clock is ticking every day to do what I want to do with the sport. So, you know, your calendar uh, says who you are. If you're spending an hour and a half on Sophia every day, that's an hour and a half you're not working on your game. That's an hour and a half you didn't go for a run with sandbags in your shirt the way Luol Dang used to or going around Brixton. Lord, yeah. Right, right. So how are you using your time? Your calendar is who you are. We all have 24 hours in the day. How are you using those 24 hours? Whether it be academically, sleep, interfacing with your family and working on your game. And, and what are your priorities? Because at the end of the day, everybody's got the same amount of time to prepare themselves and some use it better than others. And then the other thing that I, that's been more of late, but you know, watch basketball. I'm floored by how many kids, they watch highlights Highlight. on Instagram oh, or Snapchat and they don't watch the game. And I just don't, and I say this, I have a, I have a 16 year old at home who's an aspiring player. And, and, you know, these kids need to watch the game. It doesn't have to be the NBA. It can be any level of basketball, but you know, I watched the uh, London lions on YouTube the other day, but, but you need to watch the game and watch a quarter, watch a half, uh, watch a whole game, uh, understand how guys play, understand ball screen coverages, understand spacing, understand how different teams play, watch great players set their man up, watch great players get to space, um, you know, watch guys how they t handle pressure. Um, because if you don't watch the game, I just don't know how you can grow. Um, and, and I'm floored and I know we all have a whole world at our hands right now on our phone, but these kids need to watch full games and put their phone down and just watch basketball if they really want to be good. Oh, coach, yeah, I get so frustrated. They'll see a highlight, a miss shot or a made dunk or, oh, and I'm like, the game is so much more than that. Like that can't help you. Like, yeah, it's coach, uh, yeah. Um, as I said, I know you got your, the time's running. We got a couple of minutes, so. Um, Coach, thank you so much for, for being on with us. Um, definitely invaluable um, information. 
um, you've given us today. Um, I really want to come down and watch your uh, watch your practice or whatever, man, and 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 see how you. I love the way, like how blunt you are, and you know you tell it as it is. Um, I, I I love that stuff, man. It's just just hearing you know I want to see that interaction with the players and how you convey that message over. But that's it's, it's absolutely awesome. Um, and thank you for, for, for hanging out this afternoon. Absolutely. My pleasure. Great questions. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And our gym is open to anybody that's watching this. If anybody, especially in the UK, is over this way and we get past COVID here by September of 2021, our gym is open to everybody and uh, happy to have people in. And I, I'm in London every summer learning from a bunch of great UK coaches. And I'm always, you know, asking questions and learning from them. There's some great coaches right now that I learn from who I do Zoom calls with during quarantine to learn. So, uh, you know, I, I just like to share and uh, learn and teach. And, and But my bluntness comes from that death clock running on the on the desktop, <laughs> man. Like, uh, time, I, I don't have any time for messing around. So, uh, no, I, I very much appreciate it, Coach. Thanks for having me on. Thank you very much. Joe Mantegna from Blair Academy. You've been watching the Euro Steppen. Check it out. Appreciate you watching the Euro Steppen. I want to thank everybody for watching Euro Steppen. Watching the Euro Steppen. The Euro Steppen. The Euro Steppen. You've been watching the Euro Steppen. The Euro Steppen. The Euro Steppen. You've been watching the Euro Stepping, a great podcast show hosted by Coach D.